it can be whatever you know, general types any questions things you might be wondering about at this point okay all right well i'll just kind of keep moving on then and going through the document and talking about just in, in broad strokes what the type that is going to be doing as they go on so again we're going to keep paging the document You'll notice that again, I'm not really looking at stacks or bad breaks or anything like that. What are you doing there? Hmm. Very strange. I must have made a mistake there. Um, set you the PCAST. There we go. And again, I'm in paging mode at this point. You would stop and handle any images like that. But here I have an image call out. That may be me taking things for granted. So I'll just point this out in, in, the, in the design. We chose to do something helpful in that any image call out is just, you know, bright blue. And we did that so that it stands out to the types that are as they're going along and doing things. So even if we're not going to use this text, we can still sort of um, build in some additional functionality for it. And in this case, the functionality refers to the type setter. We don't want them to miss an image call out because let's say they missed the first image call out. And all of a sudden now they got to redo the whole chapter because they need to put in some half-page image somewhere. Um, so we could manually place this image, but I'm going to show you another um, InDesign feature. And it sort of is helpful. It's going to place the image, place the caption. Uh, they're going to be in separate text boxes, and they'll be sized to match up with this text format. Um, this is helpful because you could have an image that goes really gigantic, a very big image, and then the typesetter is manually resizing it to fit but this tool does it automatically. So I'm going to select the um, call out and the caption, and then just some text after it. it doesn't have to be any particular amount. We just want to make sure these two are selected and this little bit is selected. Under scribe tool, images, place single image. It'll pop up um, a, a box that says sort of like, what image do you want me to place? And here I have a folder in that um, sample file set that's called images, and I want to select figure 101. I know I want to select figure 101 because that's the name of the call out that we would have placed in the composition stage. And I say okay. So it removes the call out, removes the caption, puts the text over here on your pasteboard, and again, sizes it to match up with your text frame. So you can see the text frame and the image are the same width automatically, which is very handy. I'm going to keep placing that. And then down there. So again, I'm kind of priming myself by doing these big changes before I go down to look at the little stuff that we looked at, like stacks and bad breaks. So we're really looking, moving from big issues to small issues, placing our sidebars, placing our images, and then continuing to look for these things. Uh, you may set any tables, um, and then for now, uh, we're going to kind of assume, unless anybody has any more questions about that, that you know we're, we move through and we go do the rest of these these checks. Uh, much of it's the same exact thing: placing images, placing uh, figures, equations, uh, and then handling any paging breaks. So if I were to keep going down and hit, you know, like chapter two, then I would do the same basic thing all over again. And all I'm doing is really just getting myself set to start with the, um, the, the granular changes. At this point, after all the images are placed, after if there's tables, you, you might have some tables, then we check the typography of the book. And the typography checks are exactly those uh, things that I described before, looking for stacks, looking for bad breaks, making sure the text is not too dense, not too tight, very readable, and then looking for any kind of like bad breaks or things like that. So for now, I'm going to get into some different um, what I call flexibility features in this, because there are ways that we can change the styles. But um, placing images, sure, we can go through that. Karen's asking about placing images again. I'm going to do it in. Um, I'll do it in two two different ways. I'll show you the manual way first, the way that's kind of natural to InDesign, and then I'll show the tool again. So if I were to go through placing images here, I see. I have to place figure 
0103. And here is the caption for figure 0103. And then one other important thing, here's the call out for figure 0103. I wanna make sure that the call out and the image are as close together as possible. To do it manually, it would sort of resemble what we did in placing the IDCT. We would go to place. I would navigate to that images folder, find the specific file and hit open. It kind of shows you, it's like grabbed the file and you're gonna tell it where to go. So I'm just gonna click over here in the pasteboard and then see how it is. So here's one of those issues that that tool kind of solves. You can see it's like super big. Um, I may not want it to be that big, I, I may, but for the purposes of this, I think that's super gigantic compared to the rest of the text. And I need to resize it. Now here's one of those things where I have to remember where a tool lives when I always grab it with the hotkey. Um, there it is, okay. So I wanna shrink the tool. There's one tool over here, or shrink the image, and I'm gonna use the free transform tool. That will make it so that uh, as I'm shrinking things down, it's shrinking the image as well. So this actually brings up one important thing that, uh, that we wanna talk about with images. Because I feel like it's easy to think of, this is the image, but it's actually two things in one. It is the frame for the image, and then the image inside it. I'll show you what that means. If I were to grab this little center, this little like circular box, I can actually drag the image anywhere in the frame. Um, and so that's why I always grab that free transform tool, because if I were to just select this box and start uh, uh, dragging it down and resizing it, but it's like cutting off a bunch of the image now. Uh, this brings up a point that'll be very important for the ebook because um, your typesetter could be, you know, grabbing things and making little adjustments. Maybe it's a photo and they don't want half the people in the photo, so they just drag the frame to sort of obscure it, but they haven't actually changed the file itself. So now when you go take that file into the ebook, it's the whole thing, not just the crop version. So that's an important thing to kind of communicate to your typesetters that, hey, these are like our requirements, these are our best practices. Um, we have all of those up on um, both our website and on the modules as well. Um, but these are the kind of things that the, they want to be aware of. But for now, I'm just going to size this as I would normally. It looks kind of big too, so. Well, let's say I have the image the way that I want. I can delete that call out because I don't need it anymore. I want to cut this um, caption. So I've selected the whole thing, including the paragraph break. And I cut it as I would normally in Word, you know, Command X or Control X. And then I can just hit Command V to paste it and kind of align these two together. You know, this style that we that we made has a, I don't know if you can see it, has a rule built in above it. So that just automatically sizes to the width of the text frame, this red line over there. And I'm gonna delete an extra hard return. I could drag that box up to the very end. There's also a way you can just double click that and it automatically sizes to however much content is there. And now I can place the image as I would normally. You might see these little lines kind of popping up as I'm doing things. Those are, those are what are called uh, smart guides, which are really handy. I can either go to the you know, middle of the page, which is that big pink line, or the middle of the text box, which is a smaller purple line. So there's things that help you as you go. looking at space up here just to make sure that there's an appropriate amount of space between the images. We want that to be kind of consistent throughout. You know, if I were to go down another line or so, maybe two lines, like that would definitely be a problem. We don't want that to happen. So I just to make sure there's a good amount of space there. So Karen, is that helpful? Okay. And now real quick, I'm just going to walk through the tool again. Because I think you can see there's a lot of different manual things we just did that just get handled automatically for us when we use that tool. I don't believe that, I don't need it. And again, to use the tool, I want to select the whole uh, call out line, the caption, and then just some text after it. It doesn't need to be any specific amount. And I'll go to scribe tools, images, place single image. 
go through that same process of telling you design which image I want to place. Now we have it there sized appropriately. So it kind of handles a bunch of stuff that you just saw me walk through in one big fell swoop, making it a little easier for us. Okay. Um, good to move on so far? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna talk about two different ways that the typesetter can change text without affecting um, the actual book itself. And some of this is related to maybe some limitations in how the book functions. Um, I'll kind of give you an example of that here. So let's say that I did want more space above this one particular A head. I've run into a scenario where I hit an A head and I need more space above it. Well, you don't want to do this. I don't want to say, like, well, I just need an extra little space there. That's fine. Um, because you can kind of see it's picking up this definition of a head, so it's got a dotted rule above it. A lot of it's from mistakes. But I still maybe have encountered a scenario where I want this to have a little extra space above it. Um, I can make what's called an alt style. And essentially, that's just the name of any style with the hyphen alt after it. So now this allows me to have a different kind of a head that functions differently from anything else. This maybe has, now it has, you know, 4P above it. And I can apply this new style to this A head. Uh, the reason we built in this convention of having any style uh, with hyphen alt after it, uh, essentially in the extraction tools, it's going to look for those alt styles and map it back to the root. So this will just become a regular A head later on, which is what I will want for the um, for the ebook. These exist for any different kind of scenario where you need something to function a little differently for the print version of the book, but you don't want it to be its own style. Um, some of the, so I feel like it's often a case by case basis. So I'll give you another quick example. Um, there are different hyphenation dictionaries in InDesign. And when we do non English text, like you might have a glossary in English and Spanish for a textbook, um, I would still want to use a basic glossary style like GLO, uh, but I would need it to function differently for the Spanish text so that it hyphenates properly. Well, I can make a GLO hyphen alt style and tell it to hyphenate according to a Spanish dictionary as opposed to an American English dictionary. And the nice thing about that is now I can just select all those texts at once, tell them to behave in a different way, and cause no problem as going on to the next um, the next stage in the game. So is anyone, is, is that sort of, um, clear as to why that might be helpful, this, this opportunity to create a new style, have it still map back to the root style, and allow different functionality within InDesign. I'm happy to address any other questions. If that's not, if it's not clear why that's helpful or anything like that, please let me know. I can give a couple other examples as well. Okay. Um, I'll uh, real quickly talk about another example, and these are combined styles. When we say combined styles, you might get things like, uh, we'll go back, there we go. Um, here's a quick example of when a combined style is necessary. I have an I style over here, and I works great on things like this that I need to be italic. It just makes them italic. It curls up the correct font. But now if I need something in a B head, if this was the title of a book, for example, and I apply I to it, this got into something we saw last week where now this is a different weight. And additionally here, because this is a base italic font, like it's italic as part of its definition, you know, it's not emphasis. We would want this to be actually Roman rather than italic. So I can make a, what's called a combined style for this particular example, make a new style. And I want it to be whatever the root style is, in this case, BH hyphen I. And now I can say, well, this actually has to be light. And now this would be the proper way to uh, apply emphasis in something that is italic. This might happen if maybe you have, um, you have poetry and you decide that all the poems are gonna be italic in your book, but there's an instance of uh, emphasis. Well, then you would need to set it 
uh, Roman, so you might make an SLI style that applies Roman rather than italic. And, and a lot of this is just to sort of get around the nature of different typefaces. You may not even, you know, you may have a style that doesn't use the word italic. It is oblique. So you can't say, well, just use italic because the font's going to look missing because it doesn't have a, a version called italic. Um, and a lot of these are just built into the style. This, you know, so this maps back to I later on, just like how um, AH alt maps back to A head. Okay. Questions so far? Good to go. Okay. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is something that uh, we refer to as uh, TSO styles. These get very handy. And again, it's all about um, making sure that your book is correct to move over into um, ebook production. I'm going to show you a quick example of why a typesetter would need to introduce something called TSO. Um, this is something that happens a lot. You have a quoted quote, or maybe someone's referring to something in a quote. So it ends with a single, um, let's see, I'll put that there. This maybe occurs at the end of the quote. Is everyone kind of seeing what this example is? We have a single quoted word at the end of a quote. So these adjacent double quotes there. Uh, the typesetter may want to insert a little bit of extra space there, you know, a thin space or a hair space to show that this breaks up. So that's, you know, I would call this typographically correct. It looks it looks a lot nicer. It's not all jumbled up. But now the problem is I have the space character here. If this goes into ebook, then it just looks like that. Then it just looks, I would say, like incorrect. There's just a space at the end of that sentence now. So what we do is we highlight that text, and we have a character style called TSO. And I apply it to this, um, this character. It doesn't do anything except tag it for removal, essentially. Uh, when we go to extract text for ebooks from InDesign, anything tagged with TSO just gets killed, basically. Um, this could refer to these little um, you know, spaces like this. You could apply it to things like um, your uh, like page numbers. We have a separate one specifically for page numbers, but in your TOC, page numbers don't mean anything anymore. So we often just remove them for the ebook uh, because they are redundant. Um, it's a helpful tool because um, it just basically means that the typesetter isn't worrying about these, and if we're applying them, it's uh, it's automatically removed later on. Later on. Um, I always offer a word of caution for that because I think someone, you know, like a new subscriber, accidentally applied that to every single um, number in his index. So when the index came out, it was just like word, comma space, comma space, comma space, comma space, and that was the same for every single entry in the index. So you have to use it with caution, make sure that you're applying certain things to it. You may want to have it um, render with like a, a character or a color or something like that, just so that you know that if you apply it to a certain letter or something like that, that all will get removed because it's tagged with TSO. So it's a helpful tool, but you just have to kind of use it, um, use it correctly and use it mindfully. Any questions so far? Everyone good to go? So Tim, just to reiterate, you're yeah. we are all wearing our typesetter hats right now. We're not necessarily wearing our project manager hats. Mm -hmm. Yep. So these are the things that the typesetter is looking for, but no one out there needs to commit all of these commands to memory. Yeah, that's correct. I know this is something that comes with experience, and I think, you know, um, the best, the best case of learning is often I have this issue, it comes up, and I, you contact us, and I say, like, oh, well, you can use this tool, and they can get the result that you need. So right now, I know we're all kind of talking in generalities and um, hypothetics, but um, I, mostly I want you guys to know to, that this is available to the typesetters. So that, let's say even if you are going to typeset your book, know that these tools are there, or at the very least, kind of guide your typesetters to address these issues in the proper way. Um, and just make them make them aware of them as well. And again, all these tools and best practices are, are listed in the, that typesetting module. You can always refer to that or have the typesetters refer to that later on. Um, let's see, but if anything's not clear, if you're sort of like, that sounds useless, I don't get why that's important, like please feel free to let me know and I can uh, come up with a horror story that I'm sure has happened or imagine one. And let you know that these are why we 
do these things to avoid other issues down the road. And that's the main thing with the, you know, like you said, having your types that are hat on. For us, that means we're always thinking about these styles as well as how things look. It's very easy to get into the typesetting mindset where, well, the PDF looks good and it's printed fine, so that's good. But maybe you've introduced a ton of errors that um, then get moved on to the ebook stage. Um, so for right now, I think what I want to do is I want to start moving our minds into typeset QC at this point. And I'm going to walk through a couple different steps. I think we will take a, um, a quick, or we'll take our lunch break after I walk through those steps. And then I have a file that I want to send to you guys to do it as well. And that's where we'll break into our experimental breakout rooms. Let me know if that sounds okay to everybody. Because much of the typesetting stuff is just continue to do that for the rest of the book. You know, place the images, look for stacks and bad breaks. Okay. Well, if there's no questions just about typesetting procedure right now, please let me know just to, I'm going to reiterate real quick what we did. So we'll step back to PM hat. We took the assets everybody needs. We, the designer sent us these template files, or we made them from their approved design. design. Um, we have the IDTT file. We put the template and the IDTT together by placing the IDTT into the design template. And then we started um, doing, using some of the scribe tools to handle issues that would normally cause problems later automatically. Um, we applied breaking rules. We ran the rebreak URL tool that handled problems that we'd have to look for. We discussed other things and types that are looked for in terms of bad typography, whether it's stacks, tight text, loose text, bad breaks. Um, and then we walked it through different ways of paging the book and different ways of um, what did I just, what did I just talk about? Um, different ways of applying new styles to address different issues as they arose. So for now, I'm going to put this document away.